have it. It's funny, as I was going back through my teaching archives, granted, uh, my oldest archives are, I ha used to handwrite all of my notes way back 33 years ago. And I have boxes and boxes of notes, which I haven't gone through in many, 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 many years. But in terms of those which I do have archived, and then the next phase, when I first started using a computer, we were still using floppy disks. Do you remember those? I think I have some floppy disks somewhere, but I have no way to look at them and see what's on them. So the archives I do have, I couldn't locate, amazingly, even one single Mother's Day message over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Surprised me. Historically, I've always tried to give a special message for different holidays, although in recent years, I've probably stayed more focused on Revelation and the different uh, studies that we've had. But the Lord had put it on my heart today to give a Mother's Day message. And since I could not locate one, I was forced to come up with a new one. <laughs> so, that's what we're going to do. Now, if I could just get my notes in the proper order. I forgot to, on my printer, you have one of those little things that swings out and it catches the paper. I forgot to swing it out, and so they just flew all over the place, and then they got out of order here, so... So you can get them back in order. There we go. So, now we're living in strange times, are we not? Where our newest Supreme Court justice can't give us a definition for a woman. Even though she is one. If she can't figure that out, how can she be a Supreme Court justice? I don't know. But Webster's 1828, good old Webster, I recommend him all the time. He was a devout believer. He came up with the classic Webster's Dictionary, the original 1828 edition. I looked up his definition for mother. A female parent. That only works as long as we still have females, right? <laughs> a female parent, especially... One of the human race. Really? You mean human females are more special than other kinds of females? Actually, yes, that's true. A female parent, especially one of the human race, a woman who has been born, born, given birth to a child, correlative to son or daughter. Now, this second definition which he gives is quite interesting. Mother. That which has produced anything. You've probably heard phrases like the mother of invention or mother country. In fact, Webster uses a little quote here. I'm not sure where this is taken from. Alas, poor country, it cannot be called our mother but our grave. So kind of a negative connotation there. But So our native land is called our mother country. And a plant from which a slip or scion is taken, a clipping, is called the mother plant. And in this use, mother may be considered as an adjective. Why is it that we say things like the mother of invention, mother country, rather than using the word father? Why is it that when an athlete waves to the camera, he or she always says what? Hi, Mom. I don't know if I've ever seen one say, Hi, Dad. They always go, Hi, Mom. I think it's because all life springs forth from the mother. It's because God created women to be the nurturers, the comforters, the encouragers. And, of course, we live in a day and age where the prince of this world is trying to steal that from us. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, to destroy, to take away those important distinctions between motherhood, fatherhood. There's absolutely nothing demeaning or derogatory about saying 
that women are the nurturers, the comforters, the encouragers. Now, in this day and age, we have a lot of male nurses. There's nothing wrong with that. But historically, if you've noticed in times past, nurses were almost exclusively women. Why is that? Because they're a lot more compassionate than men are. And when someone is seriously wounded or injured, somebody's lying in a military hospital somewhere where their leg or arm has just been blown off, a little comfort goes a long way, does it not? The male nurse, the male doctor probably just toss him a pill. Suck it up. But if we demoralize and dehumanize either gender, then we begin to lose the benefits that that gender brings to the table. Without moms, without women, none of us would be here, right? Even though, oh Lord Jesus. I'm trying to focus on mothers here, but folks, we're living in insane times. They're not trying to tell us that men can get pregnant. This is what the leftists, the liberals, the crazies are telling us. And in Oregon, they just installed feminine products in the boys' restroom. If I was in high school today and they put one of those in my restroom, I'd rip it off the wall. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But without our moms, without women, none of us would be here. And if we could somehow find a way to enter this world without them, it would be a very cold, harsh world indeed. Men send their children off to war. Women are there to comfort them and care for them when they come home, if they survive. Genesis 3.20 Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Eve's name means life or living. Eve was the mother of all living. Living Now notice something again. Eve is not the mother of the animal kingdom, is she? Or the plant kingdom? Or the vegetable kingdom? And so when it says she's the mother of all living, that again tells us that humanity, God's creation, the human race, carries a much higher level of significance than the rest of creation. Again, there are those wacky, insane out-to-lunch nut jobs that would like to convince you that you're no more important than a tomato. Right? You can kill a baby right up until birth and even beyond now in some states, Maryland, California. What was the other one? There was What was it? Colorado. Colorado. My former home, my wife's native state, again transformed over the past 30, 40, 50 years. But if you harm an animal, man, you're in big trouble. You are going to go to jail. But kill the babies all day long. And by the way, did you see what happened when it was leaked by someone that the Supreme Court is getting ready to overturn Roe versus Wade? The leftist liberal nut jobs are going insane. They are so bloodthirsty, so desperate to kill babies. How can anybody be that sick or insane and they're running our country folks and it's our fault you know that we have nobody but ourselves to blame we have nobody but ourselves to blame and by the way I have friends who were with me in lockstep in terms of supporting our previous president They've now begun to back away. But I'm telling you, why Roe versus Way is about to be overturned? Because of Donald J. Trump. He is the one that appointed those judges to the Supreme Court. Who else would have or could have done that? Don't forget that, folks. The next time you want to slur him, slander him, criticize him, first look in the mirror, check out your own life, and then realize what he has actually done, what he did. And look how much they've destroyed our country in a year and a half. We went from energy independence to $4 to $5 to $6 to $7 gasoline. 
We have a war between Russia and the Ukraine. There were no wars during his presidency. Do you realize that? I'm sick and tired of all the garbage thrown at him. I look at fruit. I look at results, and you should too. And look at the results of this current administration. They are systematically, rapidly destroying our country. Did any of you watch 2,000 Mules? Three people, four, five. D Dinesh D'Souza released his film this past week with video footage, computer analysis of all the mules. They call them, you know what a mule is? They, they, carry, they carry drugs for drug traffickers. Well, in this case, the mules were carrying ballots. And there was actually a lot more than 2,000 mules, but in the narrower context, the film played here in Albuquerque two nights last week. It was sold out. I couldn't get a ticket. I bought the online streaming last night. 80,000 people watched, which is, it should have been millions. They showed the video footage of the mules coming at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning with hoodies, rubber gloves, stuffing ballot boxes. And they're able to track their, with GPS tracking, all the modern technology, they were able to gain access to them. Four million hours, was it, of video footage? It was some ridiculous amount of video footage of these people stuffing the boxes and then going back to these various, quote, nonprofit organizations where they were being given the ballots, they dropped them off, they go back and they picked up their money. That's what happened in 2020. I wish everybody could see it. I'll probably buy the DVD and show it here in church, not on a Sunday morning, but if you want to come on a Sunday night or Thursday night, we will show that movie. I commend these people. No one has ever done the kind of job they've done uncovering and exposing this stuff. Catherine Engelbrecht, how many of you have heard of Catherine Engelbrecht? She has an organization she's had for 10 years now called True the Vote. She's from Texas, and she discovered way back even before 2020, at least as far back as 2016, that they had algorithms and these voting machines where they, could, they would split the votes, like one and a half votes, half a vote, three quarters of a vote, and they could flip things by awarding that extra portion of a vote to the other person. That was way back before this current election. She was one of the key players in uncovering all this stuff. And these people have risked their lives, their reputations, their livelihood, their in everything to expose this stuff. Nobody has done the kind of work that they've done in the history of our country. I encourage you to look into it more. True the Vote, Dinesh D'Souza, um, amazing, real American patriots. Okay, if we can get back into our message, I apologize. It's hard to give a Mother's Day message when they're doing everything they can to trash motherhood. Oh, Lord. My body, my choice? I don't think so. That's a baby's body in there. That's not your body. You're just the host. When you want to talk about choice, woman, you chose to sleep with that guy. And you chose not to use contraception. I don't want to be too hard on the women because the guys are just as much at fault. Because they use you, ladies. They abuse you. They use you for their own self-gratification. And they don't give a rip what happens afterwards. But human beings have free will and personal choice. And if you're going to do the dance, take the chance and do the dance, then you better be ready to be responsible for the results, which could very well be a pregnancy. It's not the baby's fault that you are a fornicator. Take responsibility for your actions. They want a free pass. They want a free ride. Live however you want to live. And when something happens, just kill it. Maybe it's time to start aborting some adults. Okay, now, ladies, I'm going to give you the rest of the, the morning here. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Genesis 3.20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. 
not the mother of all dead. I want to look at some particularly significant mothers from the Bible. Just three. We don't have time. There's many more we could look at. The first one is Moses' mother, Yoshebed. Exodus 2, beginning of verse 1. A man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi, same tribe, very common. That's how they did it. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Why? Because if you remember, Pharaoh had given an edict. He was starting to get intimidated. The, the Hebrews were gro growing and populous. Some upwards of two million Jewish people now living in the land of Egypt. It started with Joseph and his family, 70 people who moved to Egypt 400 years earlier when Joseph was the number two man in the government. And in that 400 plus years, they'd grown from those families, the 12 tribes of Israel, to a population of about 2 million. Pharaoh's getting a little freaked out. So he says, kill all the, the newborn male children of the Hebrews. So the mom, not wanting to kill her son, gee how things have changed. She hides him for three months, risking her own life and her family's in the process. If she got caught, they probably would have killed them all. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank, trusting God to protect baby Moses from all the potential hazards and ravages of the Nile. Obviously, drowning would be a possibility. We all know there were crocodiles in the Nile, snakes. She trusted God to protect her baby boy, when it was no longer possible for her to protect him, she entrusted him to God. Uh, let me read this little clip called Your Worst Nightmare. Some of the world's most venomous snakes make their home along the Nile River. The Egyptian banded cobra's venom can kill a man within minutes, although the snake is also capable of biting without injecting venom. The red spitting cobra spits venom into the eyes of an intruder, causing severe pain and sometimes permanent blindness. Black mambas, you've heard of those babies, can travel up to 12 miles per hour, but prefer to flee rather than confront a human. When cornered, they strike repeatedly, injecting potent venom that kills within minutes. Other species to look out for include the puff adder, which is known for sunbathing lazily on footpaths, and several species of vipers. And so... In spite of the tremendous risk and hazard, Yoshebed had no choice but to do the best she could. Um, she took an ark of bulrushes, a little homemade boat, basket boat, daubed it with asphalt and pitch so that it wouldn't sink, put baby Moses in there. And then in verse 4 of Exodus 2, his sister, Miriam, stood afar off to know what would be done with him. So Miriam is... I don't know if her mother sent her out there to watch or if she chose to do it on her own, but she's watching to see what becomes of Moses. Verse 5, Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. Babies do that, don't they? So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. So Pharaoh's daughter knew then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. It was her mother, Miriam's mother, Yoshebed. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. <laughs> So she gets her son back, and she gets paid for nursing him. See how God works? God honored her faith, allowing her to be her son's wet nurse. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Rabbinical tradition says that she nursed him for 24 months. So she got to keep baby Moses with her for 24 months. So there was a bonding there between mother and child. 
which is essential, as we know. Verse 10, the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. He became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. So Moses' mother made the greatest sacrifice imaginable. She gave up her son to be adopted by Pharaoh's daughter so that he might live and go on to become the great deliverer of his people. What an amazing story. Now, after the two years of nursing him, she could have refused to give him up. Would have been an understandable emotion, feeling. But in God's greater scheme of things, she made the great sacrifice. And that's what mothers do. Many times in many ways. <clears throat> My mother became a widow at the age of 40. Had three kids to take care of, living off of Social Security, my dad's Social Security. And she made many, many sacrifices on behalf of her children, I will tell you. <clears throat> Next, we have Samuel's mother, Hannah. If you remember the story, her husband, Elkanah, had another wife besides Hannah. He really loved Hannah, and he went out of his way to try to encourage her, comfort her, because his other wife was able to bear children, but Hannah was not. And again, so much has changed in our world. In biblical times, becoming a mother was considered the most important, honorable thing a woman could do. You think they ever, in their wildest dreams, ever considered aborting a child? Women like Hannah were heartbroken, desperate to be able to bear children, and unable to do so. So verse 8, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? They were having a, a gathering there with food, and everyone's eating, and she doesn't want to eat. Why do you not eat, and why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Well, that's a typical male response, isn't it? <laughs> don't ask the question if you don't want the answer. Elkanah didn't understand the deep, intense longing in a woman's heart to be a mother, for motherhood. Hey, aren't I better than ten sons? Well, I love you, man, but you're not. It's different. It's a whole different scenario. And we talked about how boys, athletes, on the football field, the baseball field, wherever the camera goes on them, they wave and they say, hi, mom. So Hannah arose, verse 9, after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, where the temporary temple was, the tabernacle, the tent. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul, and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And you know, there are women today in the same position. In fact, infertility has gone through the roof. And one of the reasons is because of abortions. Many women have had abortions. Later on, they want to go ahead and have a baby, and they can't. They've been permanently damaged. Nobody told them that, did they? You may not be able to have children later on, because the people doing the abortions don't care about that. They also don't care about the woman having the abortion. Women's health, what a crock. They care about two things, blood sacrifice, I'm kidding you not, and money. Blood sacrifice and money because I've told you a gazillion times, Satan, his goal has been from the beginning of time to destroy the human race and one of the best ways to do it is keep aborting baby after baby after baby after baby. But Hannah, she was broken hearted. <sighs> Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, 
Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head. That's the Nazarite vow. Samson was a Nazarite. Apostle Paul was a Nazarite. We have a number of them in the Bible. John the Baptist was a Nazarite. No razor shall come upon his head. The vow of a godly woman. That's what she made here. The vow of a godly woman. Lord, give me a son and I will give him back to you. We had a baby dedication here. Was it just last week? For Alex and Alec, their little baby boy. Dedicating their child to the Lord. We need to hold each other accountable on that. Many, many people have made that vow, that dedication, and have not followed through. They don't make sure that their children are in church and Sunday school, that they're being trained up in the ways of the Lord. And God takes it very seriously. We jump down to verse 21. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned. So God answered her prayer. She conceived. She brought forth her son, Samuel. She says, Not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. Much like what happened with Moses and Yoshebed. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So much like Yosebed and Moses, when Samuel was approximately two years old, his mother turned him over to Eli, the priest, where he would be trained to serve God. Now here's what happened with this guy, Samuel, whose godly mother, Hannah, cried out to the Lord, prayed for a son. God answered her prayer and she kept her vow. Samuel became the very first prophet, recognized prophet in the Old Testament. He was the last of the judges. Remember the judges who ruled over Israel prior to the time of the kings? First prophet, last judge, priest, Nazarite, and he anointed the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. That's what can happen when you dedicate your child to the Lord and you keep your promise. Now in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, we won't have time to read it today, but Hannah offers up a beautiful prayer of praise and thanks to God, much like Mary's Magnificat that we'll talk about in a moment in Luke chapter 1. It's called the Song of Hannah. And rather than moaning and weeping and wailing, Oh Lord, why did you take my son away? No, she praises him and thanks him for being gift, given the gift of motherhood. Finally, Mary's, Mary, Jesus' mother, <clears throat> according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Jewish maidens were considered marriageable at the age of 12 years and 6 months. Though the actual age of the bride varied with circumstances, the marriage was preceded by the betrothal after which the bride legally belonged to the bridegroom, though she did not live with him till about a year later when the marriage used to be celebrated. This is in agreement with other historical sources, and this was still the practice in the Holy Land even up until the early 20th century. One biblical historian notes some customs of biblical Palestine, I don't like that term Palestine, it's Israel, continued through the centuries, and after her trip to the Near East around 1910, Alma White commented on the age of marriage in Palestine or Israel. A girl is usually married in her 12th or 13th year, and sometimes as early as her 10th year. Short life expectancy was one of the motivating factors behind this early age, as the average life expectancy for most people in the ancient world was between 30 to 40 years of age. Additionally, the earliest age a woman can conceive and bear a child is typically between 12 to 14 years old. I bring all this out to point out that many Bible scholars and theologians believe Mary was about 14 when she conceived and gave birth to Jesus. Can you imagine a young girl of this age assuming such an overwhelming responsibility? 
Again, it was a whole different world, a different culture, a different society. <clears throat> I just read where Germany is in big trouble because the average age of a woman in Germany giving birth to her first child is 30 years old. And we know that in many of those European countries, the, uh, the original ethnic group, the original population is being rapidly displaced by immigration, kind of like, like what's happening in America. Luke 1, 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. This was the sixth month of the pregnancy of Elizabeth, Mary's older cousin, who would give birth to John the Baptist. you remember that? She also was advanced in years, unable to conceive, and God supernaturally enabled her to conceive and bring forth the one who would prepare the way of the Lord, John the Baptist. So in the sixth month of her pregnancy, Gabriel now visits Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And of course, Luke is very careful to point out the fact that she was a virgin to confirm the virgin birth. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. If you're a 14-year-old girl living in a podunk town, which is what Nazareth was, and an angel of the Lord comes to visit you and says, Hey, you're highly favored. You might be a little bit cautious also, right? She was a little bit... It's kind of like when somebody says, Hey, I, I need to talk with you. Can we meet somewhere? You always expect the worst, don't you? <laughs> I experience that all the time. <laughs> On both sides, both directions. Why are we always expecting the worst, right? But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, consider what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And here's what that favor looks like. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and we call the son of the highest and the Lord God will give the throne of his father, give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Really? Is that all? <laughs> then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And of course we know in the Bible when it speaks of knowing a man or knowing a woman, that speaks of physical intimacy, which can in turn lead to conception, just like we were talking about a few moments ago. It's kind of strange with all the massive emphasis on so-called sex education in our schools today, it seems like a lot of people don't understand this. When you know someone in that way, it often results in pregnancy. What part of that did you not get? Right? So Mary's only, really her only concern is how is it going to happen? Her concern was regarding the biological impossibility of the situation. I'm a virgin. I'm a good girl. How am I going to get pregnant? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Again, 14 years old. You're going to bring forth the Son of God by supernatural means. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. Of course, hers was in a natural method. God stepped in and enabled her to become pregnant, but her, the father of John the Baptist was Zechariah. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Elizabeth was barren and well advanced in years, but God stepped in and enabled her to conceive. And then the angel goes on to tell Mary to answer her question, for with God nothing will be impossible. 
Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. As soon as the angel explained how it was going to happen, she's in complete agreement, acceptance, obedience, no reluctance. Remember how Moses argued with God when God appeared to him in the burning bush? And God told Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and bring my people out of Egypt, set my people free. Moses argued and argued with God. He didn't want to do it. And here's Mary, 14 years old, no argument whatsoever. Just, how's it going to happen? Here's how it's going to happen. Okay, behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Can you imagine what we believers could accomplish in this world if we all had the heart attitude of Mary? Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Your will be done. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And the angel departed from her. That's all Mary needed to hear. She was ready to fulfill her calling, her role as the mother of the Son of God. How many men or women twice her age would display the kind of absolute faith and obedience that Mary possessed? And like Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Mary burst forth with praise in her soliloquy known as the Magnificat, and I am going to read that one. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. That was Mary's response to the angel's pronouncement that she had been chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. I would say that men are the strength and the power of God and women are the heart and soul of God. No wonder gender, parenthood, indeed motherhood are under such vicious attack today. Without these qualities and characteristics to complement and complete one another, we would be nothing more than a race of zombies. And that seems to be where we're headed. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us, who is there with God? Himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the three in one. God said, let us make man in our image. God didn't say that about any other part of creation. According to our likeness let them mankind men and women have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him and not to ruffle any feminist feathers male and female he created them then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That means have kids, have babies. Fill the earth with worshipers of God and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Why? Because we are created in the image of God. Psalms 8, 4 through 6. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Folks, we are not the scourge of the planet. 
Do you realize that's what many people are telling us today? That we are like a cancer. We are like a blight. We are like the scourge of this planet. We are not. We are the crown of God's creation. The human race. Created in His image. Not to be defiled. Not to be cast down as horrible, defiling, embarrassing. There could never be any greater honor or achievement than being the one that is tasked with bringing forth and nurturing human life on planet Earth. Mothers, women. One more time, Genesis 3.20. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she, in some circles you're not allowed to say she anymore. You know that? It has to be they, them, whatever. They, they're encouraging people to use the phrase people who menstruate. Hence the female napkins in the boys' bathrooms. Nebuchadnezzar defied God and he went nuts. Crawled around on his hands and knees and ate grass like a cow. Saul defied God, disobeyed God, went crazy, demon-possessed. Folks, you defy God. You reject God, you blaspheme God, you go nuts. I guess that's not considered an appropriate psychological term. We don't say that here. Mentally challenged. But when you defy God, deny God, go against God and His creation, you will lose your mind and they have lost their minds. Eve, she. Don't be embarrassed to be a she if you're a she. Don't be embarrassed to be a he if you're a he. But this is Mother's Day, and I would say that of all the Hallmark holidays created to sell greeting cards and flowers and other things, I would propose to you here today that Mother's Day is the most important and valid of them all. Let's stand. <clears throat> Father, we lift up all the mothers today. We thank you for them, Lord. We wouldn't be here without them. Oftentimes they get a bad rap. Lord, they're kind of like the quarterback on a football team. When things go well, they get credit. When things go bad, they get all the blame. Or they probably don't get enough of the credit when things go well. And they get all the blame when things go bad. We ask your forgiveness, Father, for not treating our moms better, for honoring them as we should. Help us to do better. Help them to forgive us when we don't give them the recognition they deserve. But we pray that on this day, you'd pour out your spirit upon the moms represented here, those watching online, wherever they may be. We ask for a multitude of blessings to be poured out on our precious, precious mothers. We thank you for all the nurturing, the comforting, that they've given to us throughout our lives, the care given to us. And Lord, for those maybe who feel like they got shortchanged or maybe their mom wasn't all that they'd hoped she would be, we ask you to give understanding and insight into the things that may have contributed to that. We know that our, our mothers, our women, are very comforting, nurturing, but they're, they're very vulnerable emotionally. You made them that way, Lord, so that they could comfort us and nurture us. And so they're very vulnerable to criticism, to, to uh, abusive language and so forth. So we ask you to give us patience and understanding with those who maybe have struggled in their role as mothers. We pray for healing. For those that are still with us, 
Lord, some have passed on. We hope and pray that we will see them in your eternal kingdom. But for those who are still here, we pray for healing and restoration for moms who have really had a hard row to hoe. Encourage them, strengthen them, uplift them, and heal them from any wounding that they've experienced. We thank you for them. Bless them abundantly. Now I'm going to ask for a show of hands if you need prayer this morning. Raise your hands. I'm going to pray for you all. Father God, you see every hand. You know every request that's on their hearts and minds this morning. We left up health issues, Father. We've read this morning that with you all things are possible. You're able to cause a young girl named Mary to conceive and bring forth your only son. Lord, you can do anything and everything. We pray for healing, for physical issues, for diseases, for afflictions, for injuries. Lord, please pour out your healing oil upon all those in need of a touch physically this morning, Father. Pray for those with mental and emotional struggles. Lord, we know that anxiety, fear, worry, doubt, depression, these are all things massive numbers of people are facing in our world today. We pray for your comfort, for your strength, for your encouragement. Lord, we pray for healing of body, soul, and mind. Lord, we know that you died for every part of us, body, soul, and spirit. We ask for healing, God, in Jesus' name. Pray for provision for those struggling financially with economic issues. We pray for jobs that are needed. We pray for better jobs that are needed. We pray for provision any way and every way you choose to do it, Lord. We recognize and acknowledge that you are our provider. We give you the praise and the thanks and the glory for all the blessings we do have, and we pray for blessings to be poured upon those that are struggling, Lord. Encouragement. Help them to keep their eyes on you, trusting in you. Lord, you never fail us. We thank you, and we pray for healing of relationships, marriages, friendships, work relationships, neighborhood relationships, anywhere and everywhere there's a strain in relationship. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit, a spirit of reconciliation, restoration, and healing, Father. We thank you for all that you are, all that you've done for us, and all that you continue to do. And again, we ask multitude of blessings upon all the moms in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's join Roy in a final song. Your love is